I'm afraid I've got some very bad news to share with you. Although widely anticipated, it's not happening. The prospect of a future resurrection has been cancelled. But don't get alarmed. I mean the TV series, the one about dead people mysteriously returning to life. The first season apparently was a great success, but then ratings plummeted for the second season. Consequently, a projected third season has now been cancelled. Popular opinion, it seems, has ruled out any hope of a future resurrection. <laughs> as far as the eschatological prospect is concerned, this has almost always been the case. The vast majority of people, both ancient and modern, have rejected any hope of a future resurrection. And perhaps this is not surprising. After all, in terms of philosophical ideas, resurrection is one of the most difficult to swallow. The empirical evidence is undeniable. Other than claims of near-death experience, the dead remain dead. They don't return to physical life. Hence, to speak of resurrection from the dead is likely to invite scorn and ridicule. And yet, this belief is central to Christian theology. It's a core element of our soteriology. As Paul reminds the Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Our salvation is grounded on the concept of resurrection. But not only is it a core element of our soteriology, it's also a core element of our eschatology. As the classic creeds remind us, as Christians, we believe in and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead. However, this has become a somewhat controversial topic in recent discussion. While Christians have traditionally wrestled with the nature of the resurrection body and its continuity with our present mode of existence, the current debate has focused more on the timing of the resurrection. In particular, the idea of an instantaneous or immediate resurrection has been advocated by several main mainstream New Testament scholars. And this has been endorsed by at least some evangelicals also. Thus, like the traditional idea of an intermediate state, the common understanding of a future resurrection of the dead has also been challenged. So in today's lecture, we'll consider what resurrection meant in the ancient world, how this informs our understanding of the biblical perspective, and in the light of all that, what we should envisage when we speak of the Christian hope of rising from the dead. We begin then by considering how the motif of resurrection was employed and understood in the ancient world. Uh, this may seem a strange place to start, but I think it is important. It may help clarify what the biblical authors had in mind when they use resurrection terminology. It will also help us appreciate how the concept of resurrection would have been heard or received in its original milieu or ancient setting. As Tom Wright underscores, when the ancients spoke of resurrection, whether denying it or affirming it, they were telling a two-step story. Resurrection itself would be preceded and was preceded even in the case of Jesus by an interim period of death as a state. Where we find a single step story, death as event being followed, by, followed at once by a final state, for instance of disembodied bliss, the texts are not talking about resurrection. Resurrection involves a definite content, some sort of re-embodiment, and a definite narrative shape a two-step story, not a single-step one. This meaning is constant throughout the ancient world. For this reason, Wright insists on distinguishing carefully between life after death, i.e. the state that immediately follows physical death, and what he famously describes as life after life after death, i.e. the post-resurrection situation. As we'll see, this has a significant bearing on both the meaning and the significance of resurrection. And this was likewise the case for how the concept was understood in the ancient world. 
As previously noted, the Egyptians had extensive teaching on the afterlife. But while they obviously conceived of the dead and the afterlife in a very physical manner, essentially as an extension of the present life, there's absolutely no thought of resurrection. The concept plays a more significant role in Canaanite religion. Ugaritic epics, for instance, portray both Baal and Mot as seasonal deities who die and rise again. However, there is absolutely no thought in these texts of human resurrection. In Mesopotamia, as in the Old Testament, the underworld was thought of as a dark and gloomy place located in the deep recesses of the earth. Unlike the Old Testament, however, a more detailed depiction is offered. However, the texts that depict some form of escape concern merely the temporary return of deceased spirits or gods, not the physical resurrection of human beings. Thus, Johnson aptly concludes, the successive Mesopotamian cultures of Sumerians, Assyrians, and Babylonians had no belief in resurrection from the dead and therefore exercised no influence on Israel's emerging resurrection belief. The question of a Persian influence is more plausible, albeit controversial. Zoroastrianism dated back to the late second millennium BC and included a developed eschatology with the idea of a general resurrection of the dead. Johnson summarizes as follows. On the third day after death, the soul ascends to the sacred mountain where its previous thoughts and deeds are weighed. If good dominates, the soul crosses a bridge to heaven. If bad, it plunges into the underworld for punishment. At the end of time, there will be a general bodily resurrection and the last judgment by fire. Here the good will be divinely protected and proceed to eternal bliss on a restored earth, while the bad will completely perish. Now there are several familiar concepts there, so we can appreciate why some argue that Zoroastrianism has had a profound influence on Jewish and consequently Christian eschatology in general and the concept of resurrection in particular. However, while this may account for Israel's resurrection faith on a late dating of Daniel and Isaiah, it fails to explain pre-exilic and early exilic references to the concept of resurrection, for example, Ezekiel 37. Moreover, while Zoroastrianism has certain aspects in common with Jewish eschatology, there are also significant differences. For example, in Zoroastrianism, resurrection follows rather than precedes judgment. There are two, admittedly, judgments. And human bodies must be recreated from the elements rather than rising directly from the ground. We were talking about burial practices uh, yesterday. Uh, Apparently, Zoroastrians uh, exposed the corpses for vultures to consume. Um, any such exposure of the dead would have been totally abhorrent to Jews. Even so, it's clear that the concept of resurrection was essentially the same. Resurrection denotes an eschatological return to bodily life. In Greek and Roman culture, the idea of resurrection was ardently denied even by those who firmly believed in an afterlife. While two of the major influences, Homer and Plato, differ radically on their concept of the afterlife, each rejected any idea of resurrection. Homer insists that it simply doesn't happen. In the Iliad, Achilles declares to Priam, who's grieving the death of Hector, lamenting for your son will do no good at all. You will be dead yourself before you bring him back to life. As we noted on Friday, Plato's concept of death and the afterlife was much more positive than Homer. Death was not something to fear or regret, but something to be welcomed. It was the moment that the immortal soul got released from the, the bodily prison. But that's the very reason why resurrection makes no sense. The afterlife is infinitely better than the, the present bodily existence. So who would want to return to such? Thus, the idea of resurrection was excluded. For Plato, not only was it impossible, it was also undesirable. 
Uh, following Pythagoras, however, Plato did entertain the, the idea of reincarnation or the transmigration of souls. But this is a, a radically different idea from the concept of bodily resurrection. Transmigrated or reincarnate souls are not re-embodied as the persons they once were. There's absolutely no continuity between the body shed at death and the one into which they are subsequently introduced, allegedly. Moreover, such reintroduction of a soul into a bodily prison was clearly not the ideal. The ultimate aim was to escape this cycle, escape the body altogether. So the Platonic idea of transmigration bears no relation to the biblical concept of bodily resurrection. The same is true of other ideas in Greco-Roman culture, such as the stoic concept of palingonesia, the cyclical rebirth of the entire universe, or the mythic notions of ap apotheosis and astral immortality. Therefore, despite widespread belief in an afterlife, there seems to be nothing like the concept of bodily resurrection. Rather, apart from Jews and Christians, the Greco-Roman world appears to have used resurrection language for a concept they philosophically rejected and categorically denied. For some, it was irrational. For others, it was undesirable. But in both popular and educated thought, it was utterly impossible. Unlike the, the Greco-Roman world in general, an expectation of physical resurrection is frequently articulated within Second Temple Judaism. Indeed, as Wright observes, the evidence suggests that by the time of Jesus, most Jews either believed in some form of resurrection or at least knew that it was the standard teaching. But clearly not everyone embraced such teaching. According to the New Testament, Josephus and the rabbis, the leading dissenters were, of course, the Sadducees. Their rationale for rejecting this teaching, however, was not simply that they thought this idea was patently absurd, although evidently that was true, as we know from their familiar interaction with Jesus. However, as the religious conservatives, ostensibly they rejected this doctrine because they found no evidence for it in the Torah, in the Pentateuch. But undoubtedly there were other more political reasons as well. In any case, as we noted yesterday, the Sadducees apparently rejected not just the prospect of resurrection, but also any idea of post-mortem existence that might facilitate such. But the Sadducees were by no means alone in rejecting the afterlife. We've already noted the attitude to death and beyond reflected in Ecclesiasticus. Do not forget, there is no turning back. Sorry, there is no coming back. A similar perspective is reflected in 1 Maccabees, in which no hope of a future life is held out, only the prospect of a, a glorious reputation among future generations. Other apocryphal books, such as Tobit and 1 Baruch, are likewise silent about any meaningful afterlife. It's clear, therefore, that within Second Temple Judaism, as within the Greco-Roman world more generally, the concept of resurrection was met with at least some degree of skepticism and unbelief. <coughs> Perhaps surprisingly, however, this does not seem to be the majority view. I say surprising because of the influence of Hellenism. One would have expected it to be the majority view. If we can assume the general accuracy of the LXX, by the third or the second century BC, belief in future resurrection was apparently mainstream, at least among Alexandrian Jews. Despite its Hellenistic milieu, there's no attempt in the LXX to soften texts that speak of resurrection. Standard resurrection vocabulary is employed in all the relevant texts, such as Isaiah and Daniel, Hosea and 2 Maccabees, texts that we'll look at shortly. Indeed, some texts which actually deny the prospect of resurrection in the Hebrew text, thinking of Job 14, verse 14, and Hosea 13, verse 14, these texts have apparently been flipped on their head in the LXX. Such resurrection faith during the Hellenistic era is plainly attested in 2 Maccabees, which unambiguously speaks of a future reversal of death in the context of imminent martyrdom. 
the King of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. I got these tongue hands from heaven and because of his laws I disdain them and from him I hope to get them back again. One cannot but cherish the hope God gives of being raised again by him but for you there will be no resurrection to life referring there to the enemy. The creator of the world will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again so that in God's mercy I may get you back along with your brothers. It's the mother whose sons have been martyred. Accept death so that in God's mercy I may get you back again. The hope of resurrection here is clearly not something that coincides with the death of these martyrs. Rather, it's something that would take place in the future, but it evidently not happened yet. In the meantime, those who had died would remain in some kind of intermediate state, as suggested by the familiar reference in 2 Maccabees to praying for the dead. Thus, as Wright concludes, resurrection belief throughout 2 Maccabees means new bodily life, a life which comes after the life after death that dead people currently experience. A similar prospect is reflected, albeit more cryptically, in apocalyptic liter literature such as One Enoch, the Apocalypse of Moses, the Sibylline Oracles, the Testaments of Twelve Patriarchs, Four Ezra, and Two Baruch, most of which closely associate such physical resurrection with final judgment. While not explicitly mentioning resurrection, One Enoch holds out the prospect of blessing for the righteous in a very this-worldly paradise after eschatological judgment. In the similitude section of this composite text, resurrection is even more clearly suggested. In those days shall the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it, and Sheol also shall give back what it, it, what, that which it has received, and hell shall give back what, that which it owes. While there are further hints in the following sections of the book, perhaps the most explicit references are in the final section in which we read, The spirits of those who died in righteousness shall live and rejoice. Their spirits shall not perish, nor their memorial from before the face of the Great One unto all the generations of the world. The book ends as it started with the scene of final judgment, during which justice will at last prevail for the people of God. I will call the spirits of the good, who are of the generation of light, and I will transform those who were born in darkness, who in the flesh were not recompensed with honour, as was fitting to their faith. And they will see those who were born in darkness thrown into darkness, while the righteous shine. And the sinners will cry out as they see them shining, but they themselves will go where days and times have been written down for them. Obviously not a happy place. While the resurrection language found in other apocalypses mentioned above is even more explicit, the overall picture is essentially the same. Those who have died, both the righteous and the wicked, are presently awaiting the day when they'll rise again and face God's final judgment, leading to vindication for some or condemnation for others. Consistent throughout is the concept of resurrection as a future i.e. an eschatological event involving the physical re-embodiment of those who have died. As noted yesterday, if Tom Wright is correct, the same perspective is also articulated in the Wisdom of Solomon, a book that many associated with the, the more platonic understanding of the afterlife. Read within its narrative sequence, chapter 3, 1 to 10, is not teaching the platonic doctrine of disembodied eternal bliss for the soul, Rather, this text offers a twofold response to the false claims of the ungodly. The ungodly were suggesting that people should live for the moment, since death ends everything, and that the future visitation and vindication anticipated by the righteous is a vain hope. Against these ungodly contentions, the author asserts that though the wicked may have killed them, the righteous have not disappeared forever, as the wicked suppose. Rather, at present, they are safe in the hand of God. 
who accepts their suffering and death as a burnt offering. But this is merely the first stage of the two-stage afterlife which the author is depicting in this significant text. The second stage, set forth in chapter 3, 7 to 10, portrays the still future status of the righteous dead, whose hope is full of immortality. Contrary to the denials of the ungodly, there will be a visitation, a day of judgment, when God will vindicate the righteous, and the righteous will shine forth, run like sparks through the stubble, and reign in God's kingdom. Understood thus, the Book of Wisdom, despite evincing some degree of Hellenistic influence, is much closer than often thought to the mainstream opinion of the Pharisees and their rabbinical successors. The Pharisees, as attested in the New Testament, Acts 23, 6 to 9, were staunch believers in a future resurrection. In his attempt to distinguish their beliefs from other Jewish sects, such as Sadducees and Essenes, Josephus explains that the Pharisees hold that every soul is immortal, but that only the souls of the virtuous pass into another body, while those of the wicked are punished with an everlasting vengeance. Now, at first glance, this might suggest transmigration or reincarnation, but it must be interpreted in the light of the more explicit references to bodily resurrection found elsewhere in Josephus. Admittedly, his apologetic method, namely using Greek philosophical language to communicate Jewish beliefs, is potentially confusing. However, it is clear that although he avoids the word resurrection, and while probably not a Pharisee himself, Josephus firmly embraced the concept. For example, he clearly expresses his own perspective on the topic when addressing the issue of suicide. He asserts, Surely you know that people who depart from this life in accordance with nature's law win everlasting life. Their souls remain without blemish and receive the most holy place in heaven. From there, when the ages come round again, they come back again to live instead in holy bodies. Not surprisingly, such belief was also standard among the Pharisees' successors, the rabbis. One of the central prayers of rabbinic Judaism includes three explicit references to resurrection. You live forevermore and raise the dead. You nourish the living and bring the dead to life. Blessed are you, O Lord, who bring the dead to life. Likewise, the Targums evince a strong belief in resurrection, sometimes making more explicit the idea than we find it in the Masoretic text. For instance, in Hosea 6 and verse 2, after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his presence. The Targum reads, He will revive us for the days of consolation which are to come. On the day of the resurrection of the dead, he will raise us, and we shall live in his presence. So it makes much more explicit what might be implicit in the Masoretic text. In a somewhat similar vein, Job chapter 14, 12 to 14, is made to deny only the resurrection of the wicked, evidently making room for a future resurrection of the righteous. In the original context, the Masoretic text, Job is denying resurrection, period. Thus, with the exception of conservatives like the Sadducees and those influenced by, by uh, Platonism, such as Philo, it seems clear that a significant number of Jews, arguably the majority, believed in the resurrection of the dead. Significantly, this was understood as a future eschatological event, often involving both the righteous and the wicked. The souls or shades of the righteous would be re-embodied in physical flesh, that was, or at least would become, more glorious than the present human body. So where did this idea come from? Where did this idea originate? Most likely source is, of course, the Old Testament, and so it's to there that we turn as we begin to examine the biblical theology of resurrection. Insofar as the Old Testament is concerned, 
the scholarly consensus is as follows. The Old Testament is largely silent on the idea of the afterlife in general and personal resurrection in particular. Indeed, in some places, the doctrine is explicitly denied and comments on the afterlife are not dissimilar from those of Homer. The doctrine of personal resurrection is considered a very late development in Old Testament thought, not really appearing before the post-exilic or Hellenistic era. The underlying rationale is as follows. The only undisputed reference to the physical resurrection of the dead is in the latter half of the book of Daniel, Daniel 12. This is a book dated by most scholars to the second century BC. This unambiguous reference to resurrection is thus located within the period when other Jewish writings likewise reflected an expectation of personal resurrection. Previous to this era, the Jews or Israelites did not expect a physical resurrection, although the concept was occasionally used as a metaphor for national restoration. D. The traditional Hebrew understanding reflected almost everywhere else in the Old Testament was that the dead went to Sheol and that the only real hope of deliverance, in inverted commas, from Sheol was pre-mortem. Yahweh could intervene to save from premature death and thus snatch someone from the clutches of Sheol. But any thought of a post-mortem deliverance from Sheol was either not envisaged at all or was dismissed as highly unlikely. Thus understood, insofar as the afterlife is concerned, the Old Testament reflects at least two quite distinct points of view. The first, the traditional perspective, is primarily focused on God's gift of a long and blessed life in the present world. And this view looks on death and Sheol as something to avoid for as long as humanly possible. The second and new perspective, conceived mainly in the crucible of persecution and martyrdom, is directed more towards the next world and views death as the path to eventual vindication and eternal life. Understood as such, the doctrine of resurrection was a radically new idea, born in response to a particular crisis that Israel faced, namely Hellenism, and a particular issue for which traditional theology had no real answer, i.e. the martyrdom of Yahweh's faithful people. So that's the standard critical perspective on this topic in the Old Testament, as I understand it. However, rather than a radically new idea that sprung to life almost overnight in the second century BC, the seeds of Israel's resurrection faith are arguably found much earlier. Indeed, a case can be made for tracing Israel's thinking on resurrection, which unquestionably developed over time, back to what we might call their foundational beliefs about God. As noted above, Daniel 12 contains the most explicit reference to an anticipated resurrection of the dead. Immediately following the portrayal of unprecedented distress in his final vision, Daniel receives the following assurance. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Here, resurrection language clearly applies to those who are physically dead. They're sleeping in the dust of the earth. It includes a twofold company, the elect or wise, and implicitly the reprobate. It involves eternal consequences, on the one hand, everlasting life, and on the other, shame and everlasting contempt. And it alludes to a glorified status for the righteous or wise, who will shine like stars forever. They'll not become stars, but they will shine like stars. However, this is arguably not, not the more fully developed doctrine that we see embodied in the intertestamental or New Testament literature. 
It seems to focus exclusively on Jews, Daniel's people, and possibly not even all Jews. Multitudes, literally many of, is presumably exclusive rather than all-inclusive terminology. Moreover, in context, this resurrection most likely concerns those caught up in this period of unprecedented distress. In other words, as envisaged here, resurrection is probably not a general or universal concept, the resurrection of everyone who has ever lived. Rather, it seems to be more an ethnic event with a fairly narrow focus. Perhaps, as Johnson suggests, those who die in or after the final period of persecution and anguish, some to be rewarded for their resistance and others to be shamed for their collaboration. Thus understood, the doctrine of resurrection in Daniel 12 is still a far cry from the more developed theology articulated in later Jewish and Christian thought. However, it is clearly associated with vindication and justice, and is certainly not envisaged as a state entered immediately at death. Rather, it is a future event that will follow a period of rest. While other Old Testament texts employ the concept of resurrection, Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, this usage is often understood simply as a metaphor for national restoration. In other words, when read in context, these passages are not heralding the prospect of a literal resurrection of those who were physically dead. Rather, bodily resurrection is simply figurative, a metaphor for physical rest restoration from the metaphorical death of the exile. This is most obviously so in the case of Ezekiel 37. The overarching focus of this and the surrounding chapters is spiritual and national restoration. The scattered bones represent the nation's apparently hopeless state of death and impurity in a foreign land. The reconstruction and reanimation of the corpses refers to the recreative power by which Yahweh would bring the nation back to life, as it were restoring them from the death of exile to life again in the promised land. Thus, as Wright suggests, Ezekiel is no more envisaging actual bodily resurrection than he envisaged when writing chapter 34 that Israel consisted of sheep rather than people. Whatever its influence on subsequent thought or even modern hymns, this vision is not really about the prospect of physical resurrection. According to some scholars, the same holds true for Isaiah 26, verse 19. Here, however, opinion is much more divided. While the context is again that of national revival and restoration, and while the image of death's abolishment is apparently used for the nation's future in chapter 25, 7 to 8, here in 26 verse 19, it is arguably more than simply national restoration that is on view. The verse reads as follows. But your dead will live, there or my corpses will rise. Awake and sing for joy, O dust dwellers, for your dew is like the dew of first light. The earth will let go of or make fall the shades, the Rephaim. I should say this text is extremely difficult to translate and interpret due to both textual uncertainty and grammatical ambiguity. But that sort of gives you the gist of it. This seems to be describing individuals rather than the nation per se. It's shades, Raphaim, what we would call souls. Moreover, the prospect of res resurrection stands in marked contrast with the statement recorded just a few verses earlier concerning the wicked, of whom it said, The dead will not live. The shades, the Rephaim, will not rise. Therefore you have punished them and destroyed them. You wiped out all memory of them. While it is admittedly possible to interpret both these texts in terms of national restoration, or the lack thereof, the imagery seems to suggest individual resurrection. In any case, the two concepts, i.e. individual resurrection and national restoration, should probably not be so sharply distinguished. As Wright underlines, the resurrection of God's people is ultimately the form that national restoration will take, thus driving too great a wedge between the two ideas is probably unhelpful. <clears throat> 
Indeed, both concepts are in some sense fused in Isaiah 53, where Israel's restoration is achieved through the servant. After his harrowing, suffering and death were told, the servant will see his offspring, prolong his days, see the light of life and be satisfied. While resurrection is not explicitly mentioned here, it's fairly clear that the servant suffers fatally and thus resurrection from the dead is at least implicit. But how this resurrection and the future resurrection of God's elect are related will not become clear until we reach the New Testament. However, a a close reading of Isaiah along with Daniel, particularly chapters 7 and 12 of Daniel, may certainly offer some important clues. Anyway, to get back to our main point, national restoration and individual resurrection may not be so far removed from each other in Isaiah 26, as some scholars suggest. Like Ezekiel 37, Hosea 6 verses 1 to 2 is another prophetic text that arguably employs the concept of resurrection for national renewal. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who is torn, and he will heal us. He is struck down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. It's not exactly clear who the implied speaker is here. Some believe that Hosea is offering his audience a suitable prayer of repentance, whereas others conclude that Hosea is citing the inadequate and indeed the superficial response of rebellious Israel. The surrounding context certainly supports the latter, in which case there is further reason to question whether this text is actually speaking of resurrection at all. Moreover, the context and language would seem to suggest restoration from sickness rather than resurrection from death. Thus, despite the mention of third day and its evident appeal as a messianic prophecy, I suspect that this text has little, if anything, to do with the resurrection of the dead. There are, of course, several other texts from which the concept of resurrection has been inferred. But in most cases, the plain meaning, at least insofar as the Hebrew text is concerned, would suggest otherwise. Or the precise meaning of key clauses is somewhat obscure. Uh, Despite later eschatological interpretation, Psalm 1 verse 5 referred neither to resurrection nor to final judgment. Rather, like the Psalter as a whole, the Psalm has a decidedly this-worldly perspective, as is clear from the final verse, verse 6. While Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, along with the LXX and other ancient versions, interprets Hosea 13 verse 14 much more positively, the Hebrew text is almost certainly denying that Yahweh will redeem Israel from Sheol and death. As far as Job 19 is concerned, Job is most probably expressing confidence of vindication in this life. And we know from the end of the book that that's exactly what happened, chapter 42, verse 5. Thus understood, Job is persuaded that his Redeemer his Goel, arguably God himself, or the mediator mentioned in chapter 16, 19, will eventually arrive and stand, i.e. testify, on Job's behalf at the ash heap. The NIV is upon the earth, is literally on the dust. That is Job's anticipated grave. However, Job's Goel, his redeemer, will do so prior to Job's death. Although Job's skin by that stage may all be scraped off, Job will still be alive. He is still in his flesh. And thus this and Job's seeing God implying the restoration of divine favor is not anticipated as a post-mortem experience. Admittedly, such an interpretation is heavily influenced by the fact that throughout the book of Job, any hope of a post-mortem escape from Sheol is apparently rejected. Sheol is the place of no return. Those who end up there are confined with no hope of improved circumstances. Given this and the negative stance towards resurrection hope that Job adopts just a few chapters previously in chapter 14, it seems very strange if Job 19 does speak of resurrection 
It seems very strange why such an answer to Job's plight doesn't reverberate in subsequent speeches in the book. I'm sorry if that ruins Handel's Messiah for anybody. Uh, it's not meant to. It's clear, however, that despite the apparent absence of resurrection hope in some parts of the Old Testament, there are other places where such an idea is at least incipient. For instance, God's sovereign power to raise the dead is apparently acknowledged in the songs of both Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 39, and Hannah, 1 Samuel 2, verse 6. In the former, Yahweh declares, See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And no one can deliver from my hand. In a similar vein, Hannah acknowledges that Yahweh kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Both the sequencing, kill and make alive, wound and heal, kills and bring to life, brings down to Sheol and raises up. And the parallelism suggests that the power to raise the dead and not just rescue from near-death experience is what is on view here. Arguably, it could be both. Obviously, the implied speakers had no personal experience of Yahweh's power to raise the dead, such as subsequently demonstrated through Elijah and Elisha. However, rather than explaining such convictions here in Deuteronomy and Samuel by means of an exilic date or Deuteronomistic redaction, it seems better to see them as flowing from an early and absolute confidence in God's sovereignty and power. In other words, neither Moses nor Hannah is saying that Yahweh has or will raise the dead. They're simply saying that he could, should he wish to do so. I think we see the same thing expressed by Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 5. When he's leaving his servants behind, he says, I and the lad will go up there to worship and we will come back again. It's a plural cohortative. A very strong way of saying, both of us are coming back down this mountain. And obviously Hebrews eleven nineteen interprets that, that Abram fully was persuaded that God could raise the dead if necessary. At the very least, this suggests that even though a resurrection faith was not part of Israel's early theology, the germ for such belief was certainly present in what they did understand about Yahweh. Over time, and nurtured in particular by the crises they faced, such a germ came to fruition in the conviction that Yahweh not only could, but actually would raise the dead. It's undeniable, nevertheless, that there are few, or rather few, explicit references to resurrection in the Old Testament. And that's true even if we include the possible allusions, the metaphorical examples, and some of the more controversial proof texts. Evidently, the idea of resurrection, like most aspects of personal eschatology, was not a significant focus for most Old Testament authors and presumably their readers. But it's equally clear that this was not the case when the subsequent apocryphal and apocalyptic materials were produced in the intertestamental era and beyond. It would seem, therefore, that the crises of this era helped crystallize a more mature resurrection faith. However, this does not prove that the concept was entirely unknown any earlier. Indeed, if we take the biblical text at face value, Israel was familiar with the concept long before it was enshrined as an article of eschatological faith. Moreover, if we reject the notion that the latter half of Daniel is simply Vaticania ex eventu, i.e. history dressed up as prophetic prediction, the prospect of resurrection was around much earlier than the second century BC. And the latter is confirmed to some extent by Ezekiel 37, which while admittedly using resurrection as a metaphor, as we've said, it does clearly employ the concept. In other words, whatever Ezekiel may have thought about resurrection before his vision of the dry bones, Afterwards, both he and his readers could no longer wonder whether Yahweh could do such a thing as raise those long dead to new life. Granted, they may not yet have firmly believed that Yahweh would do so, but the idea must certainly have been plausible. Otherwise, the illustration in Ezekiel 37 would deconstruct the main point. 
Can you imagine trying to encourage your congregation with a future hope using an illustration that they thought was absolutely bizarre and impossible? That's not the illustration that would work. Moreover, the fact that Ezekiel 37 deliberately echoes the two-stage creation of humanity in Genesis 2 is surely intended, among other things, to highlight the fact that Yahweh as creator is the Lord of life and death, something which the Israelites had apparently known for centuries, Deuteronomy 32, 1 Samuel 2. In contrast with the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the prospect of resurrection is everywhere assumed. Now, this is hardly surprising, given its obvious significance for the good news of the kingdom. But even prior to the resurrection of Jesus himself, an eschatological resurrection is clearly an acknowledged and anticipated fact. This is clearly so in the teaching of Jesus himself, particularly in the Gospel of John. For example, in John 5, Jesus declares that a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. In the following chapter, Jesus speaks several times of raising up those the Father has given him on the last day. Reflecting such conventional Jewish beliefs, a similar perspective on resurrection is expressed by Martha in John 11. In response to the Lord's assurance that Lazarus will rise again, Martha confidently asserts, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Rather than contradicting Martha's conviction, what Jesus says next merely qualifies it. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Here Jesus is obviously alluding to what he had previously said about the spiritually dead receiving life through him. John 5, 24 to 25. He is thus reorienting Martha towards the significance of such new life even now in the present time. But any such realized eschatology does not negate the prospect of a future resurrection on the last day as is quite clear from what Jesus has already stated plainly in chapters 5 and 6. Eschatological resurrection is almost certainly implied in the warning about the Queen of the South and the men of Nineveh rising up or standing at the judgment with the present generation. And it's also affirmed, as we've already seen, by Jesus' interaction with the Sadducees, who are apparently challenging both the prospect of a future resurrection and the related concept of a more temporary afterlife beforehand. Thus, the relevant teaching of Jesus appears to suggest that resurrection was chiefly perceived as a future event, which, as often in Jewish eschatological thought, was closely associated with the idea of final judgment. Therefore, while the concept may also be used to denote the awakening of new life in the spiritually dead, the suggestion of an immediate resurrection at death seems to have little, if any, textual support in the Gospels. Maybe I should say explicit textual support. The same conclusion arguably applies to the Pauline epistles and the rest of the New Testament. In Paul, the future resurrection of believers is clearly assumed and is explicitly tied to the eschatological return of Jesus in a number of places. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul addresses the timing of the resurrection directly, assuring his readers that at the second coming of Christ, the dead in Christ will rise first, just before Christians who are alive at that time are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Clearly, there's no suggestion here of an immediate resurrection at death. Rather, believers who are deceased will all experience resurrection at one and the same time, namely at the second coming of the Lord Jesus. In a similar vein, the resurrection of believers is explicitly tied to the Lord's return in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here Paul is tackling the arguments of those who were clearly denying resurrection. Evidently, their denial related to a future bodily resurrection of the dead, 
But as Paul emphasizes in verses 1 to 18, they had obviously failed to think through the logical ramifications of their stance in relation to Christian faith and behavior. Paul spells this out, chapter 15, 1 to 19, and 29 to 34. As well as firmly grounding the Christian hope of resurrection on that of Jesus himself. Verses 20 to 28. Alluding to the Old Testament barley harvest, Jesus is depicted here as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As such, his resurrection attests to the future resurrection of believers also. But the sequence and the timing are again made very explicit. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. As elsewhere, this correlates the resurrection with the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And this is confirmed by the following verse, which clearly ties the resurrection of believers with the eschaton, the end of history. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God uh, to, sorry, well, he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Now, admittedly, some suggest that the then at the beginning of verse 24 implies a further temporal hiatus, so that there's a significant period, namely a millennium, between this future resurrection of believers and the final destruction of all dominion, authority, and power. However, this is surely untenable in the light of the immediate and wider context, which focuses primarily on the destruction of the last enemy, i.e. death, by means of the future resurrection, which some in Corinth were actually denying. In other words, Paul is insisting here that Jesus must reign between his own resurrection and the final defeat of death in the resurrection of those who belong to him. And it will be at that latter stage when he destroys the last enemy and not some thousand years hence, that Jesus will hand the kingdom over to God the Father. Thus understood, once again, the resurrection of believers is closely tied to the final judgment of all that opposes God. Moreover, towards the end of this chapter, Paul tells us that the resurrection of the believing dead and the transformation of living believers, that is, those who are still alive when Jesus returns, will take place simultaneously. Both will receive their heavenly bodies at the last trumpet, heralding the glorious appearance of God, when death will finally be abolished forever. In the latter part of this chapter, Paul is obviously addressing the more practical ob objection to the prospect of future resurrection, namely, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have? And Paul's answer is essentially this, they'll have a body suitable to their new environment. While there will be both continuity and discontinuity between the present me and the resurrected me, Paul's main emphasis here is clearly on the discontinuity involved. He illustrates this by A, the difference between the seed that is sown and the plant it produces, verses 37 to 38, and B, the fact that even in the natural world there are various types of flesh and bodies, verses 39 to 41. He then drives home his point in verses 42 to 49 by contrasting the distinctive aspects of the natural body, the soma psychicon, inherited by the, from, from the first Adam, a living being made of the dust of the earth, and the superior aspects of the capital S spiritual body, the soma pneumaticon, secured through the second Adam, a life-giving spirit who is from heaven. Hence, the body sown, i.e. buried, is perishable, but is raised imperishable. It is sown, buried, in dishonor, but raised in glory. It is sown, buried, in weakness, but raised in power. In short, our resurrection or our glorified body will be like that of Christ's. As Paul goes on to point out, this must be the case since flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is not suggesting that our resurrection bodies will be non-physical, but rather that our present physical constitution is unsuited to our eternal inheritance. That is due to the fact that it is frail, it is corruptible, 
it is subject to decay. And that's what prompts Paul to address the question of those who are still alive at Christ's coming. You see, they too must receive bodies suited to their eternal home, writes Paul. We will not all sleep, we will not all die, but we will all be changed. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. And he goes on to reiterate and explain why this must be so. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when this takes place, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thus, in response to a question about how the resurrection of believers is even feasible, possible, Paul insists that it is conceivable with a little lateral thinking, as it were. But he also insists that the kind of change that it affects is absolutely necessary. Not just the Christian dead, but also the Christian living must undergo such transformation in order to inherit the kingdom of God. And both will experience this change simultaneously. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. Clearly there's no room here for an immediate resurrection at the point of death. Hence those who espouse such a view are forced to conclude that the viewpoint reflected here and back in 1 Thessalonians 4 must subsequently have been abandoned. That is to say, Paul must have later changed his mind on this particular issue. Such a change is evident, some suggest, in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. According to F.F. F. Bruce, recent brushes with death led to a change in Paul's thinking. Previously, he assumed that the resurrection would not occur until the second coming, which hitherto he had considered to be imminent. Now that death was for Paul a more likely scenario, Paul gave increased thought to the believer's situation in the afterlife. Consequently, in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10, Paul has allegedly shifted to a radically different viewpoint. Believers have resurrected bodies from the moment they die. According to Mary Harris, such a shift in Paul's thought is indicated by the verb for clothed that's used here in connection with the believer's heavenly dwelling. Rather than the verb put on, found in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul now uses the doubly compound form to put on over. Harris infers from this that the heavenly dwelling, i.e. the resurrection body, is viewed as a kind of cloak that is cast over the undergarment, the earthly body, as soon as the latter dies. However, this does not necessarily follow. Rather, the indirect object of putting on over is arguably the inner man, or naked self, or even the resurrected earthly body, which such heavenly garb will gloriously transform. Either way, this makes just as much sense of Paul's choice of verb here, and would seem to undermine this particular argument for immediate resurrection. Harris also argues, however, on the basis of the present indicative verb in verse 1. If the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. From this, he infers that the loss of the earthly tent, i.e. our mortal body, and the acquisition of the eternal house, i.e. our resurrection body, happen simultaneously. Once again, however, this is not the only, or given the surrounding context, the most plausible interpretation. Uh, that's just a shorthand way of saying, I don't think it is, at least. While Paul, does, while Paul does assure us that we have such an eternal house in heaven, he does not necessarily imply that it will remain there. Rather, like other eschatological blessings which God has stored up for us, we will actually experience or actually take up residence in this eternal house at the renewal of all things. In other words, we will not enjoy our new and permanent dwelling 
prior to the last day. So what I'm saying is that what we have here in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 is the present assurance, a guarantee of a future acquisition. Paul is saying nothing here about the actual move-in date, as it were. The main argument against this, however, is that Paul is undoubtedly thinking of our immediate post-mortem situation in the following paragraph, where he does speak in terms of being away from the body and at home with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. The some take the latter, being at home with the Lord, as broadly synonymous with the heavenly dwelling referred to in the first three verses. In other words, being at home with the Lord presupposes having received a resurrection body, an eternal house in heaven, our heavenly dwelling. However, this does seem to assume too much. It assumes that Paul has the same prospect in view in both paragraphs, when in actual fact he seems to have in view two quite different prospects. In the first paragraph, he does seem to have our resurrection state in mind. It's this final state of being clothed and not found naked for which we groan, for which God has fashioned us, and for which the Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. To be clothed with our resurrection body so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life, that is indeed the ultimate goal. But Paul has also alluded in these verses to the penultimate, the disembodied state, when he speaks of being unclothed, being found naked. Being unclothed or naked is contrasted here not with righteousness or morality, as some suggest, but with being clothed with a resurrection body. Moreover, in verse 8, Paul equates being at home with the Lord with being away from the body, not simply being away from this present body. It would seem, therefore, that the post-mortem prospect that Paul has in mind in verses 6 to 10 is a disembodied or intermediate state, the state of the believer between death and the general resurrection. This state of being away or out of the body is the equivalent of being unclothed or found naked, which Paul has alluded to previously. But as Paul makes clear here, for the believer, such temporary nakedness does not mean homelessness. Rather, it entails being at home with the Lord, or as he puts it elsewhere, being with Christ, Philippians 1, 23. It's for this reason, rather than the prospect of being bodiless, that death is something that Paul can reluctantly welcome. But it's crystal clear from our passage where Paul's ultimate hope lies, and where the Corinthians' hope, indeed where our hope, should ultimately lie. And it's that hope and all that it entails that should motivate us to use the body that we now have to please him. 2 Corinthians 5, 9-10. Thus understood, the only real shift in Paul's perspective here in 2 Corinthians 5 is that he now sees his own death as most likely to occur prior to the return of Jesus and the associated resurrection. Thus, while the language and imagery used to express the concept may be different from before, there's no real change in the underlying theology. Elsewhere in Paul, the resurrection of believers seems to be consistently presented as a future eschatological fact. While not using the word, Paul seems to have the concept in mind in Romans chapter 8, verse 23 when he speaks of the redemption of our bodies. It's not good when your pastor leaves the room. Uh, I must have said something heretical. <laughs> He'll tell me later. <clears throat> so I'm suggesting here that the concept is in mind in Romans 8, verse 23, when Paul speaks of the redemption of our bodies. The immediate context speaks of the future glory that will be revealed in us, Romans 8, verse 18 and creation being liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Moreover, the chapter climaxes with the fulfillment of God's purposes for us that nothing in all creation, not even death, can finally thwart. Therefore, even though he doesn't say so explicitly 
It's possible that Paul envisages resurrection here as a climactic reality, closely tied in with the eschaton and the renewal of all creation. But even if Paul th is thinking here simply in terms of the final transformation of living believers, it's clear from elsewhere that he understands this and the resurrection of the dead as simultaneous events. The same applies to what Paul says in Philippians 3, 20 to 21, where again the future glorification of our bodies is expressly linked to the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Thus, unless one concludes that the timing of these two events is not presented here as closely correlated, one must surely conclude that Paul is thinking of resurrection here as a climactic eschatological event. Moreover, since both Romans and Philippians were written after 2 Corinthians, we must also conclude that either Paul has changed his mind once again, or, as seems much more likely, Paul held firmly to the same resurrection beliefs throughout. While the rest of the New Testament may have little to say explicitly about a future resurrection, what it does say confirms that it was a foundational Christian truth, Hebrews 6 verse 2, and was viewed as a climactic event closely linked with the final judgment that would take place at the end of history, Acts 24, 14 to 15, and of course Revelation 20. Revelation 20 is clearly of particular significance because here, as in John 5, resurrection is depicted as twofold and encompasses more than just the Christian dead. Verses 4 to 6 focus primarily on what John describes as the, the first resurrection. This resurrection clearly involves not only the righteous dead and takes place prior to their millennial reign with Christ. Indeed, it appears to facilitate the latter and can be understood figuratively as either a spiritual resurrection or rebirth, as in John 5 verse 25, or more likely, their spiritual union with Christ in his resurrection, Colossians 2, 12, 3, 1. Either way, the second death, the lake of fire, has no power over those who participate in this first resurrection. Plainly, such is not the case for the rest of the dead, who do not come to life until the, the thousand years are ended. The latter, implicitly second, resurrection appears to take place at the end of history, immediately after Satan's final rebellion has been thwarted and right before the final judgment. In keeping with John 5, 28 to 29, this resurrection, this final resurrection, will be twofold, involving both those whose names are recorded in the book of life and those whose names are tragically absent. Moreover, this twofold resurrection will have, a very, will have very different consequences for all concerned. A second death for some, eternal life for others. Thus, while all will indeed be raised at this final resurrection, the experience for all will clearly not be the same. For some, it will be a resurrection to life. For others, a resurrection to condemnation. But more on that tomorrow. To conclude then, we return to the question with which we began. In light of both the biblical and non-biblical testimony, how should we perceive the Christian hope of future resurrection? Well, clearly it is something that will take place on the last day and not a moment beforehand. There is little obvious support for the idea of an instantaneous or immediate resurrection and much that plainly speaks against that idea. Admittedly, such a thought may have more legs, if you'll pardon the pun, if such investiture is associated with the idea of timelessness. That is, if the dead are no longer part of the space-time continuum, but like God himself are outside time, so to speak. However, while this idea may help to explain some of the texts that we've been considering both today and yesterday, it's by no means self-evident from Scripture that humans enter such timelessness at death, and it arguably raises more problems than it solves. As to the nature of our resurrection body, there's evidently both continuity and discontinuity involved. However difficult it may be to tie these down, Paul clearly insists on both 
and therefore we must do likewise. If, as Paul suggests, we take Christ's resurrection body as the archetype, then the resurrection body appears to be a suitably remodeled and enhanced version of the one that we presently occupy. And the older you get, the more you warm to that idea. How God might reassemble the body we presently occupy and in what manner he might reassemble it remains unclear. But without significant continuity between our natural body and our spiritual body, our glorified body, resurrection would seem to be the wrong terminology to use. Understood in terms of our eschatological re-embodiment, resurrection is indeed the ultimate makeover. Not in the sense of being remade or recreated from scratch, but in the sense of being suitably enhanced or transformed for the age to come. Resurrection in its eschatological sense involves much more than simply being reconstituted or reanimated or resuscitated. That is to say, it's more than just re-embodiment. While both resuscitation and re-embodiment are implicitly involved, it's clear that in the case of Christians at least, there will also be a significant upgrade and improvement. For as Paul observes, the, imper the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Paul's going to uh, take some questions now. So if you have a question, if you can uh, raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. And just a reminder to uh, please keep questions uh, kind of short and to the point. And if you don't get a chance to ask a question uh, during this period now, you can, of course, uh, fill out a question slip and Paul will try and deal with that question uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, first question here. Another Northern Irish voice. Good to um, hear. Paul, what is the nature of the unrighteous, the unrighteous body at the resurrection? Do the unredeemed get a, re a, re a glorious body like the Christian? It's a very good question. The, the question is, what is the nature of the, the unrighteous resurrection body? Um, we'll maybe say a bit more about this uh, on Thursday when we're dealing with the annihilationist perspective because they have a particular uh, way of looking at this. Um, interestingly, as we saw from Paul, Paul says uh, next to nothing about the resurrection of non-believers. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't believe in the resurrection of non-believers. He's writing in a pastoral setting, speaking to Christians with particular issues, uh, and therefore you know, what he says is applying to them. Um, so it's probably irrelevant, if you like, to bring in the, the resurrection of non-believers. Although I think Acts 24, where Paul is speaking, it's quite clear he does believe in the resurrection of non-believers too. Uh, they'll obviously not have that glorified body that we get. Um, oh, sorry, obviously. I don't think they'll have that glorified body that believers have. Um, uh, so it will be something short of that. And depending on your view of hell, obviously... Um, the annihilationists would argue that they're raised basically to their their natural body, which will peter out quite quickly uh, in judgment. Uh, but if you believe in eternal conscious punishment, that's not really an option. Uh, so for those who take the traditional line on hell, we do have to explain how people who don't get a glorified body can last forever, uh, be punished for all eternity. Uh, the usual answer is that God will give them to a body suited to the purpose. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a glorified, resurrected body the way that believers would have one. Uh, Nick, in the front. Seth. Yes. You touched on the passage yesterday where Jesus answers the Pharisees and their skepticism about the resurrection. How do we... S think about Jesus' rebuke to the, to the Sadducees, right? Um, compared to the current 
uh, consensus about the Old Testament view of resurrection. On the face of it, James seems to, Jesus seems to affirm that the Old Testament and even the Torah affirms resurrection. Yep. Okay, um, so the question is, how do we explain Jesus' attitude to the Old Testament and he goes straight to the Pentateuch, he goes straight to Exodus to defend uh, the concept of resurrection. Probably not the first text that you and I would have jumped to had we been in that situation. Uh, but clearly, Jesus is assuming that the idea of resurrection, the concept of resurrection, can be found in the Torah, in the Pentateuch. Uh, the rabbis did something similar around the same time. Uh, there was a lot of debates, uh, but the, the rabbis tended to plunder the, the Pentateuch for texts in support of uh, a resurrection idea. Uh, as I, I'm sure you realize from what I've said, I think that the concept of resurrection is clearly in the Old Testament from its inception, uh, even though it didn't develop as a, a firm eschatological uh, belief until much later. Uh, so did they believe God could raise the dead? Yes, they did. Did, did they know that God would raise the dead? They probably didn't realize that until uh, much later. Question at the back. Yeah, uh, this is in regards to bodily resurrection as well. Um, given that Jesus retained the scars of his mortal wounds in his resurrection, and in the light, light of yesterday's uh, question regarding the post-mortem disposal practices of bodies, to what extent is it helpful to see Jesus' resurrection body as the expectation for our glorified resurrection body? Okay, so um, Jesus is obviously a unique case, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, his scars... Uh, body scars are redemptive, we need to keep that in mind. So I think we need to be careful that we don't sort of extrapolate from the nature and appearance of Jesus' resurrected body to the idea that people with disability in this life will be resurrected with disability in the next, that type of thing. I'm not sure if that's what you have in mind, but I would say that's a, a false way of extrapolating. Um, but certainly in terms of Jesus having a glorified body, that's the sense in which it's going to be an archetype for what we're going to receive. So the, the nature, the glorious nature of Jesus' resurrected body uh, will be sort of the model for, for ours. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question or not. Gerald. A little more what you were saying about the resurrection body and the glorious nature of it. Um, when Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, you know, that they would come back, they would be raised, and then the, the judgment. I wonder whether the, the glorious nature is post-judgment rather than pre. Because, you see, if, ever, if people came back from the dead and it was obvious, you know, that the Olympians were going to heaven and those who looked like us were going the other way, um, I mean, the, surely the, the, the judgment would be superfluous. And, you know, could you tell before the judgment who was going where? I, I'm not sure about that. Just to tease that out a bit. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, I suspect it's going to uh, draw a speculative answer. Uh, could you tell before, um, before the judgment whether, um, tell basically the sheep from the goats? Um, there's, probably, there's probably no reason why, um, the way you put it, we mightn't, we mightn't get upgraded immediately. I think that's maybe what you're suggesting, that everybody's raised in the same way, but then after that judgment takes place, the, the, the righteous are upgraded, uh, uh, possible. I, I, think that, I think what I would say is, I don't think the Bible uh, says clearly enough for us to sort of decide on that. But I wouldn't say it's impossible. Um, I wouldn't, so I wouldn't deny it, but uh, I don't know if I'd want to affirm it. <laughs> That's uh, a political answer. <laughs> <coughs> we might uh, take two, two more questions, so one here. Thanks, Paul. Um, so just a question, so looking at Matthew 28, and, or 27, and Jesus' death, and then the dead rise out of the tomb, and then they kind of mill around the city, and then they go say hi to people. How does that coincide with a understanding of general revelation and also viewing, uh, sorry, general resurrection and viewing Jesus as the first fruits and not expecting something until later? So, uh, given in Matthew 27, there are other people who are raised before Jesus is raised. How does that tie with the idea that 
Jesus himself is the first fruit, given that people raised before, were raised before he was. I should have anticipated uh, getting some question uh, on that particular uh, issue. Um, so I'm just going to my notes here because there is a, an article, a recent article that, that sort of deals with that passage, um, which you might find uh, helpful if I can find the footnote. Yes. Um, so the question really is, how, how, you know, what do we make of uh, this sort of really odd passage in Matthew, uh, which I think most critical scholars uh, dismiss as you know, unreal, didn't really happen. Um, I think what we've certainly got is a, some kind of a mini resurrection. Uh, it's not quite clear um, from the text when it actually took place, although I think the uh, most obvious reading is that, that they, um, they rose from the dead when Jesus was crucified and uh, only appeared uh, for a few days, some days later. Um, but what's going on there, uh, I have no idea either. Uh, I think that, probably the simple answer is I have no idea. Um, but in a very recent article, I'm just reading this footnote here, uh, a guy has plausibly argued that along with Ezekiel 37 and Daniel 12, um, uh, sorry, along with Ezekiel 37, Daniel 12, 2 to 3, may help explain the controversial account in Matthew which associates a resurrection of many holy people with the death of Jesus. Uh, understood as a bodily resurrection of the martyrs who had died at the hands of Jerusalemites, Matthew 23, this event served, among other things, as a foreboding omen of imminent judgment for those responsible for their deaths. Uh, so that's how he says it, uh, but that's probably just one interpretation of many. Uh, it's a very difficult text. Uh, um, I don't think it... Um, again, I suppose... It doesn't, deny, it doesn't deny that Jesus is the, is the prototype of resurrection because those people presumably, they, well, I'll, call it, uh, I'll use the term resuscitated, but I think you know what I mean. They were actually dead. They came back to mortal life, and after either a few days or weeks or years or whatever, they died again. They weren't resurrected. Jesus was resurrected. He was the first to rise from the dead. And what I mean by that is he received... A, not just a mortal body, but an immortal body, a glorified body. Uh, and that's the kind of body that I think, um, despite what Gerald says, uh, I think that's the kind of body that we should be anticipating on the last day or thereabouts. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, last question from Chase. Hello, Paul. Thank you very much. Would you speak to um, concepts of mortality and immortality, both at creation, and then after the fall, and then now in uh, resurrected life. Can you think about those concepts and what humans were created as and for, what might have been lost and what was regained, or if this is a new thing for us as human beings, immortality? So is immortality almost the essence of humanity? Correct, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> That's much easier. Yes, Answer, thank you, Peter. no. <laughs> I don't think that God created Adam and Eve um, immortal. Um, uh, I think that they were created um, mortal uh, in the sense that they had to stay in the garden and be sustained by the tree, uh, by the fruit, uh, the tree of life, without which they would die. Uh, so I think that when we talk about immortality, uh, we're talking about A, something that God alone has, and B, is a gift of God's grace to uh, those who are righteous, uh, those who are saved through Christ. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that's all I've got for you. <laughs> Can you uh, join me in uh, expressing thanks to Paul?